Good morning. Today I'm introducing my 2014 bonding proposal that would invest $986 million in projects statewide, creating more than 27,000 Minnesota jobs. This jobs bill would address many of our state's critical infrastructure needs while strengthening our economy and getting more people back to work. Let me just touch on a couple of the highlights. I once again have made proposals for downtown improvement projects in several of our most uh, significant cities. And I again am proposing investments in the Rochester Mayo Civic Center expansion in downtown Minneapolis and the mall revitalization, the Mankato Civic Center, the uh, Children's Museum and the historic Palace Theater renovation in downtown St. Paul, the St. Cloud River's Edge Convention Center, and in Duluth, the renovation of the North Shore Theater and improvements at Spirit Mountain. In the past, uh, Two years, 2011 and 12, last year's bill was an exception to itself. But in those uh, two previous bills, I was just frankly astonished that the majorities in the Minnesota Senate and House were unresponsive to the needs of downtown uh, cities, especially at our major state and regional centers. I learned from my father and my uncles for years that downtown revitalizations are crucial to the city's economic vitality and also the surrounding region. And I, I just, uh, one of the things probably more than anything that just totally mystified me about the response or the lack of response to my bonding proposals was the unwillingness to fund these important projects. We got mayors, nonpartisan, but every bit as much Republicans as Democrats who strongly support these projects, who have lobbied their legislators on both sides of the aisle, and I'm just very, very hopeful that they will legislature this year, and it's going to take a bipartisan vote in both the House and Senate to pass a bonding bill, that they will recognize the uh, imperative that we make these improvements in our downtown regional centers. I'm also... Uh, providing significant funding for the University of Minnesota and Minskew. And I'll get back to it in a minute to uh, the needs that still exist there. The capital restoration project, I'm proposing the remaining $126.3 million to complete that restoration process. It's uh, obviously in a bill even of a billion dollars, that's about 13% uh, of the uh, total amount, so it's it, in, a, in, a, in a bill where there's already enormous competition for the available uh, resources, it, it's taken a significant dent, but I believe strongly that we ought, to, we, we ought to finish paying for the project up front now so that the uh, contractors and others can proceed with the assurance so that they'll be compensated and we can get this uh, project underway and then completed for the benefit of Minnesotans today and future generations. I just want to say, point out that in total, we received almost $3 billion in bonding requests. I'd say about 90% of them were really good projects that were seriously to urgently needed throughout our state. According to the formula that we've used from the economics professor at George Mason University, uh, another $2 billion of bonding would create another 50,000 jobs all over Minnesota. $467 million of the request came from the University of Minnesota in Minskew. About half of that was for basic maintenance and repair, the rest for new initiatives. We cannot have a world-class education system without first-rate facilities. And that's the tip of the iceberg and the structural incapacity we have right now in our bonding for, for projects that are urgently needed if we're going to keep pace with the growing needs of our society and, and provide the kind of quality of education experiences, quality of state parks and other uh, public resources that Minnesotans depend upon, that they enjoy, and that we need to continue to make ourselves attractive to uh, economic as well as uh, social advances. 
And if I uh, return in 2015, I will have some recommendations to make about how we can broaden that capacity separate from its current uh, general obligation funding source and limitations. That, uh, and I'll save that for a future date. Mr. Scholder, as in terms of the, the financing of it and using his usual urge for prudent restraint upon me and mostly complied. So he can answer questions related to the financing. If there are project questions, either I'll respond or my excellent policy person, Katie Sen, will take over. Questions on this subject? You want anything you want to add? We can go through the PowerPoint if you want to. Real quick. Okay, you're going through the whole PowerPoint? I'll do it real fast if you okay. want. Okay. Anybody want to go through the PowerPoint? Hearing no, we can go, go ahead. Back go ahead. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Uh, given, given the uh, outcry uh, for the PowerPoint. Um, <sighs> My name is Jim Schulter, and I'll do this quickly. Uh, $986 million in bonds. As you know, capital projects um, are uh, in the nature of bricks and mortar. Uh, the governor always talks about making these bricks and mortars kinds of projects, and, and we have specific authority uh, to do just that in general obligation bonds and other types of investments. Total impact of the proposals that the governor is making today is $1.4 billion. That includes both the general obligation bonds that we're talking about as well as local matches other financing sources from higher education institutions and other sources. So this is a significant set of uh, recommendations and impact that's uh, going ahead here. The approach is balanced, as you'll see in past years. Many of the kinds of priorities and types of projects that you've seen in his past recommendations are there. Uh, we'll go into the details of some of these things, but in terms of economic development, the governor listed some of the key ones, but also some of the critical state needs and, and key projects that really just need to address um, including uh, facilities uh, for uh, human services, corrections, and other places like asset preservation. The next slide just talks about the capital budget framework. We've talked about it for a little while, but just so you know, um, the materials that you'll receive in these large books will show you all of the capital projects that are in front of us, um, more than $2 billion of requests, uh, so uh, along with $8.8 .8 billion from local units of government. There are plenty of ideas for construction, and the challenge is to pick ones that are ripe, ones that have a lasting impact, and take the state in the direction uh, that we need to go. The balance of where those projects are, as shown in the chart uh, to my right, it's also a graphic in your PowerPoint slide deck, as you'll see. There is geographic distribution. You'll find these projects in communities across the state in large and in small ways, whether it's a small asset preservation, uh, dollars uh, to go help um, a facility, uh, your local armory, or uh, in a large way to create, construct a new building. The priority areas are listed as well. You'll see that uh, typically, and as in this uh, recommendation, education is the lead uh, area for investment. Most, the vast majority of that is in higher education through the University of Minnesota and the Minsky system. Economic development making sure we have adequate infrastructure to support business development, whether it's clean water, or wastewater, or parks, other things are all in that area as well. So th there's a number of different uh, priorities. I think you'll see that they're in line and pretty consistent with what you've seen in the past. If there's one outlier, it's the, the capital. The state capital uh, is something we started last year. We're going to continue and wrap up. So as you see, the state government line is unusually large, and that's really um, almost entirely due to the capital. There's some more detail in the subsequent pages, gives you just some of the key projects in each of those areas. But that gives you, I think, a taste for uh, the much longer uh, list of projects that you have now and all the materials that will be up on the MMB website uh, after this press conference. Thank you. I just, say, just qualify and say that uh, the capital is an outlier from a fiscal management standpoint, but not from obviously a, a policy standpoint and a program that uh, facility that obviously has been proven to be near and dear to the hearts of Minnesotans uh, given the overwhelming public support for what we're doing here. So uh, any other questions then on this particular subject? Do you have a breakdown between new construction and repairs and renovations, that type of thing? Well, uh, I mentioned before the, with the University of Minnesota and uh, Minsku that about half of their $469 million of combined requests goes for uh, HEPRO, they call it, the basic repairs and maintenance. The other half goes for new programs and initiatives. And you know, I agree with Commissioner Scholler that we picked uh, $986 million of projects that we are 
convinced are, are really right for Minnesota. But we had to say no to just as many projects uh, that are just as right, and several of which have been in the bonding queue since uh, I arrived in 2011. So this is the fourth bonding bill now uh, where some of them have been included and uh, not supported. So it goes back again to the structural incapacity, which I alluded to and which we'll get into in years ahead. For 2014, we'll, we'll deal with the system as we have it, and we'll deal with the the bonding constraints that that imposes, as well as uh, legislative uh, predilections. And beyond that, though, I uh, would not note the urgent need for us to uh, increase our capacity, starting with the University of Minsk, to make the investments necessary to fulfill our goal of having a world-class education system. I was concerned with the structural incapacity, but in fact, the, the size of bonding bills has been more constrained by a lack of political will, particularly in the Republican Party, to go with larger bills. How do you overcome that impediment? Well, I, I've done my best to be persuasive over the, especially the first two years, and, and particularly as it relates to the downtown economic development projects. And you know, uh, unfortunately, it was in most cases not successful for, for reasons, as I say, that really confound me. I mean, Republicans are business-oriented, and the chambers in these uh, cities strongly support these projects, and everything I learned uh, uh, on my father's knee about business development and, and civic uh, economic vitality uh, underscore the need for, for downtown projects. The natural tendency of business and new devel developments to go out to uh, outlying areas, pick greenfield sites and the like, so unless you give serious attention to downtown improvements, you start getting blighted areas, and then you end up, I remember going with Governor Purpose to Detroit back in the 1980s, and you just had this, this a concrete hole in the middle of the city with the uh, Hudson store, huge store shut down, and it was just like a con concrete fortress with no people. And that made a lasting impression on me. So, you know, in terms of the overall amount of the, of the bill, there's the constraint, there are constraints in terms of the uh, capacity that's recommended. I don't know if it's in the three percent is in statute. No, but it's been a long-standing policy. Represent Someday, if you want, uh, and not so many people here, are anyways interested, I'll give you the history of how it went from one percent to three percent overnight after Governor Purpich uh, visited bonding agencies in New York. But that's a story for another day. Houseman uh, is proposing to use some measure of surplus cash as part of her bonding proposal, which is about the same size. She thinks like 200 million. Are, do you envision using any surplus surplus cash toward uh, the bonding bill? And what is the state's bonding capacity uh, at this point? Well, the bonding capacity is reflected in the. Uh, the last revenue forecast, I think it was probably the same, close to the same in the last February, has been for a $775 million bonding bill. Uh, if we were to enact my $986 million, it would cost about 3 to $4 million of additional uh, appropriated dollars to cover in, in this biennium and then more than that in the next biennium and the subsequent ones. So there, there's a cost to, to going higher. Uh, there's also, you know, the rating agencies in sense of prudence were, you know, about 35th among the states in bonded indebtedness per, per capita. So we're in the, in the lower tier, which is where we want to be. Uh, but, you know, the trade-off is that if you don't do projects, you don't put people to work. Right. What about using cash, though? Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard uh, Representative Houseman also, uh, Senator Stumpf will both express interest in that, and since they chair the two committees, they'll obviously get the full consideration. I, I, I don't, it's not included in my bill. We're waiting, I'll wait until the next uh, budget forecast, the 28th of February, to make any decisions about what I will propose that we use any additional resources for. I'm, uh, whether that's the wisest use of of the, the money uh, available uh, relative to some of all the other demands and needs uh, will you know, just have to be, remains to be seen, but given the interest of the legislature, it will certainly be on the table. Governor, do you anticipate some criticism about whether some of these projects meet a regional or statewide significance, specifically the theaters in Duluth and St. Paul, maybe the Nicollet Mall and, and the snowmaking uh, system up in Spirit Mountain? Uh, do you anticipate there being some questions about projects like that? Well, 
I mean, to me, those are the prime examples of, proje of projects that have regional significance and statewide significance. Uh, I say again, the vitality of our downtown cities, uh, especially the, the regional uh, major cities and, and Minneapolis and St. Paul are just crucial to the well-being of this state economically. And I'll go back to the stadium. You know, the people who think that the stadium is not going to produce enormous economic returns for the city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota for years to come, long after I'm gone, are just dead wrong. And they will be proven so in the Ryan development, $400 million private development, the first uh, or the largest uh, private development, I'm told, in a, a generation in Minneapolis is proof positive that this is going to have a significant uh, benefits that are go beyond even what we are aware of today. But going back to your question, you know, the downtown Rochester. Down, Rochester and Olmsted County send about $90 million more every year to the state treasury than they get back in local government aid, county aid, and school aid. Why wouldn't we want to do anything and everything we possibly could within reason to build the vitality of downtown Rochester? Now, the Destination Medical Center, which wouldn't have passed without my support, which wouldn't have passed without the excellent work of Tina Smith, who's selected by the board to be to chair the, the undertaking, uh, it wouldn't have happened if, if, with the attitude that, well, there's no role for the public sector in economic development projects, and they'd be going to some other state in the nation, and we'd lose that. This project, this proposal in the Bonnie Bill preceded any discussions about the Destination Medical Center. So this was about re revitalizing downtown Rochester in its present state, and uh, well, given the leadership in the legislature in 2011 and 12, it was beyond my uh, experience in state government that that project in particular wasn't able to be f funded by the legislature, but they're all mistakes on their part, serious mistakes in my view. Failures, once again, to recognize that there's a role for government in economic development. There's a role for government in creating jobs. And the track we've been on for the last three years, first with opposition and last uh, session with significant support, has been to make those strategic investments and they're paying off for Minnesota. They can see that already. They will continue to. And the people who want to just put government on the sideline and shrink it and just let the private sector go for itself don't even have support of the Chambers of Commerce in these areas, much less uh, anybody who's got a, a broader, reasonable understanding of how economic development works in the real world, including the state of Minnesota. So what can you do differently to get a different result out of the legislature? We've seen these projects year after year, Rochester, St. Cloud, Mankato, all those civic centers year after year. What can you do differently to finally get it out of well, the legislature? Uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll mount the same public support, uh, particularly in the communities that will benefit from it. Again, the you know, civic leadership, the uh, local government leadership will use every power of persuasion and available. It's an election year. I mean, it's a bill where because it requires a uh, Republican votes to pass in both bodies. It's going to be one of the bargaining ships and inevitably uh, probably used at the very end. So that'll enter into it and complicate okay. matters. The election year aspect, I'm getting votes. Uh, I, th I think it probably makes it more difficult, but not insurmountable. We had passed the body bill in 2012 and passed the stadium bill in 2012. And so it's doable, but you know, anyone has any suggestions for how to Get these through. I have done my utmost for, uh, especially 2011 and 12, to get these projects passed. As you note, they're they're back again. Uh, so I suggest we we need a newer, better strategy. And I'm all ears. Governor, you you've been sharply critical, critical of Republicans. You're going to need those votes to get any bonding bill passed. Have you reached out to them at all? Oh, I have. 2011 and 12, we had morning breakfasts and. Other conversations, formal and informal, and you know, we had Republican leaders in, in those respective communities and mayors who were strongly supportive of them. So you know, you'd have to ask them what the, the basis for their opposition. But I, I think more than anything, they're, they're, they've been caucus decisions. They've been driven by the extreme right wing of both of those two caucuses which are against any government involvement. They would be against the destination medical center. They would be were against the stadium. They'd be against uh, any of the projects that have involved the state's financial participation 
that are going to bring enormous economic benefits to those cities and to those areas of the state and to the entire state. And that's you know just a fundamental ideological difference that they have with myself and I think most uh, people in the mainstream in Minnesota. I, I believe they, they hold to it sincerely. I just think they're wrong. Call that extreme right wing aside. Have you talked to them about this bonding bill? I have not talked to anybody about this bonding bill. I'm just putting it out today and we'll have conversations from this point on. This is the beginning of the process, one that will take at least the next two months before the legislature arrives, or about six weeks now, and then go on for however long they're in session. So we're talking about the beginning of a, a pro process that'll take a few months, and you know, we'll have all, all those discussions, and certainly with the Republican leadership as well as the DFL, and, and hope that we can get uh, some independent thinking in those two caucuses. Your decision not to include the Lake Vermilion Park so does that mean you wouldn't support it if it gave you it's a dear project to the Senate leader, of course? I, I uh, from the very beginning of 2011, and the majority leader understands that because my family owns uh, property on Lake Vermilion, even though it's on the other side of the lake, I've recused myself from any bonding decisions, any financial decisions, any programmatic decisions. Those all reside with, the, in terms of the program and, and policy, with the Commissioner. Uh, Landwehr, and, and in this case, I don't make any proposal. I'm, I'm not against it. I would sign a bill that had it and, and have it before in 11 and 12, but I'm not taking a position on it. Governor, I see there's no mention of Southwest Light Rail in here. Can you talk about that? Well, part of it is just a basic financial consideration. Another $125 million project is just not feasible given the limits of this bill. And given the uh, the status of it right now uh, and the fact that th those issues haven't been resolved and the reality that if we're going to have any kind of real public transit initiatives in this uh, larger region and elsewhere in the state, we're going to have to come up with, a, again, a, a funding source that's not going to be dependent on the traditional general obligation of state bonding. We just, the cost of these projects is just prohibitive unless you want to start excluding you know, $125 million of very worthwhile projects elsewhere in the state. So I made a proposal last year uh, for a metro sales tax, a half cent, that would fund the Southwest Rail and other existing and then future uh, public transit projects. And I don't know that the legislature has any willingness to take that on this year, particularly given the stalemate right now that exists with the Southwest Light Rail. Uh, we'll see how it unfolds in the next few months. I'm, I'd be supportive of it, but I think it's probably more likely it's going to be something that will be taken up seriously in 2015. Governor, advocates for the homeless have come up with a, a really large request. I see you funded about half of that. It's a bigger coalition than we've ever seen before around that issue. What were your considerations as you made that proposal for $50 million? Well, I funded a third of the total requests that came, and, and as I said, most of them were they're all serious. Most of them, many of them, urgent. That certainly is urgent. Uh, the housing finance uh, funded more, more than uh, recommended more funding there than I have in any of the bills heretofore, and wish could do more and recognize the need for more. And um, well, again, we're gonna, you know, I'll, I'll support any initiative that can can increase that amount. Have you included any projects specifically to get Republican votes? No, I'm, I, I've inclu included every project here because they, I thought they were vitally important for, for Minnesota, and I turned down many more, and I never asked anybody whose legislative district a project was in. Some of them I know because I've been here a while, but you know, I didn't have, ever look at that issue. Commissioner, is it prudent to exceed the general fund debt limit of bond rating agencies that don't look askance at that? Uh, you know, to your question, it's really two different uh, measures. What the governor was referring to was what's in the forecast, how much we anticipate in our current projection of expenditures to be going for debt service. Our debt guidelines are published with each forecast, and those show significant room uh, that can more than accommodate uh, the proposal that the governor is recommending. There's a couple of different guidelines, and, and the dip amount of space that we have in those guidelines is measured in billions. So that, for the record, that's the commissioner of MMB saying that there's an opportunity to spend significantly more money on behalf of important public projects. So. You have to pay it back. Commissioner, <laughs> <laughs> how much would it cost for you to repay the bonds in 20 years? 
Uh, the incremental amount, uh, I'm not sure. I, I will, we'll get that for you. I remember the stadium numbers were about a billion dollars in bonding is like $1.6 billion, and, but that, that's a, a guess, but over the 20 years. Huh? How should we curb the goal? This is a website quiz. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll look on the website while we uh, take the next question. I don't, I don't see high-speed rail projects on the list either, like zip rail uh, from Rochester to Quincy. Can you talk a little bit about your decision not to include those? Well, I, I gave a uh, high priority to projects that are ready to go, that are ready to in involve actual construction. That means that they're, the public supports of some of the, you know, the wrinkles there, the opposition, the has been worked out and location decisions are made. There are some out of necessity that include uh, planning and architectural design and engineering, although I, I'm still going to go back to my uh, for earlier years here where I mean, bonding, th those, those costs were paid for out of, out of general operating uh, revenue, the state or the entity, and then the bonding bill was really focused on construction, which is what I think it should be, given the cost of these architectural and engineering designs and all. Uh, by the time I arrived here, a lot of that had been incorporated into it, and you can debate that either way, but that was basically accepted practice. But I did say I want projects that, after that part of it is done, are ready to go ahead to be funded fully. And in this case, with high-speed rail, I, I'm a big advocate of high-speed rail, and I mean real high-speed rail, the kind I've experienced in China and Western Europe. And in particular, I've said, you know, I think a tremendous project would be a truly high-speed rail line, fucking 180 to 230 miles an hour, which is the current technological capacity in, in China and elsewhere, uh, going from the Rochester Airport to downtown Rochester to in front of the Mayo to the airport here, and then I'll let Minneapolis and St. Paul decide where it goes next. But, you know, that's a multi-billion dollar project. And... I don't see the resources at the federal level, uh, given the financial condition of the federal government and the lack of uh, really uh, visionary view of what public investment in the rail and, and uh, public transit area needs to be. I, I just don't see anybody who can you know, say that beyond paying for the design architectural work and the engineering studies that they're anywhere near ready to go, and if you wait a decade or whatever, Till the money came for the construction, but have to redo a lot of those uh, initial designs anyway. Governor, uh, why don't you pick the Tate Science Building? Uh, the university had a pretty long laundry list of requests, and you picked the Tate Science Building as the biggest project. Why was that your priority? Uh, I believe it wasn't that the, the, the top one of their, they had, HEPRO was their top one. HEPRO was their top priority, and the Tate was number two. Um, and they, had, they actually had five projects and you funded four of them. Including the Wellness Center in Crookston, because Center I thought that... And the Research Laboratory Improvement Fund. We had a lengthy discussion about the need to improve conditions for the, <laughs> the bees and who else was it? Uh, the Asian but the, the humans who work in those areas and who teach young people who want to work in those areas were the kind of the swing, the swing the factor in the decision. So there's money here for bees and cut? Oh, yeah, that's all on me. There's money here to improve the facilities to do research on, on bees yeah. and on their habitat and on their, and their survival. Is this a case of you shooting high knowing that the time is probably going to call for subtraction <coughs> to get a bill passed? Well, I've seen legislative uh, suggestions for, for a, over a billion. Uh, you know, I think... I've seen legislative suggestions for keeping the, the two years last year and this year at under, just under a billion, which would mean, what was last year, 156 million? What's passed? Well, what's how the much is the total bonding bill last year, the last spring? 154 So we did, then we're talking about, you know, what, 850, but even that's, you know, in the, the ballpark. I mean, my, my previous experience, my, my proposals get come out shrunken and, and without the same specifics. So I, I, I don't expect the bill's gonna go higher than that and then we'll see how much lower. But again, I just go back to the, the, the almost three to one, the number of 
uh, dollars of bonding requests for what my proposal is able to to fund and, and just if you look at if anybody looks at the needs around the state looks at the uh, these projects that were, were not included in my bill you realize you know how much is is lacking by a failure to do so one of the late on entries in, into the requests on the majority day homeless shelter did you consider that at all i did and i you know i've, I've been there uh to see their overnight uh, overflow. I've uh, served a couple of Thanksgiving lunches there. I mean, it's a fabulous program and the work, it's, as you said, it's a late entry and, and there's still issues unresolved about the location being proposed and there's, you know, debate among as from what I read and see, uh, debate among, you know, local uh, officials who represent that area and citizens group and the like. The mayor, uh, Mayor Coleman and, uh, Pat, Mr. Pat Marks, the uh, director of Dorothy Day, came to see me, a couple of others, I think it was probably early November, and you know, made a very strong case for it programmatically as, you know, it's certainly something that's needed. I, but again, my, my top priority were projects that were pretty much, you know, worked out the, the public issues and the other financing issues so they'd be ready to go. And that's one that with probably four months left until the end of the session, if they can resolve some of those issues uh, clearly and, and have the rest of the money uh, clearly identified, then, you know, um, we'll see what happens with the outcome. Governor, a project that's been a favorite of the house bonding chair is the uh, idea for a new Bell Museum for Natural History. What's your view of that project? Well, I, I, t I, try, I go mostly, not entirely, but mostly with the Minsky and University of Minnesota own list of priorities because they're closest to the situations. Bell Museum was it 19th on the? They didn't have it on their list. Was on their list. How many projects did they have? They had five projects. Okay, I thought they were more. University of Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Well, it wasn't on it. I've I've heard uh, informal review that's lower than that in their part. It's not to say it's not a worthwhile project, but it's just not. Uh, it's competing with these other projects that are you know the university considers more, more imperative and, given the, you know strong views of the chair of the. House Bonding Committee, you know, certainly, you know, be on the table uh, throughout the process. So we'll, I'm not I'm not opposed to it, but I, I do think there are higher priorities. Did you recommend funding for a fence around the Shakopee Women's Prison? Yes. Yes. I, I put the money in. I put the money in last year. It's for the fence to surround it and provide the kind of additional security that residents need and that uh, Commissioner of Corrections very much wants to provide. And also, I'll uh, make a special uh, plug also or appeal for the St. Peter uh, facility, which again is in my proposal for the fourth year. And you know, given the challenges we face there, uh, ones that the legislature uh, and I are going to have to deal with, that, that upgrade of that facility, uh, you walk through there and I mean, it's hard to believe that anything uh, sufficiently therapeutic can occur in, in a very obsolete environment with unpadded walls, with uh, sight lines for the, um, the professional staff obstructed uh, views that allow things to go on that, that shouldn't there. I mean, it's just uh, in crying need of, of these improvements and actually more, but this is you know, an expensive request, but it's, uh, I think, a crucial one. The other downtown improvement project I really should include this is one in southwestern Minnesota, the uh, Lewis and Clark water system, which the federal government got started and is now totally abandoned and is not likely to come back to in any significant way. And as a result, the, the towns of Laverne and Worthington have both uh, had to constrain their future economic growth to say no to new manufacturing program projects and, and additional jobs because of the lack of sufficient water. And so this, uh, my proposal here would take it to the next phase, state funded, recognizing the federal government is almost certainly not going to come through again, and take it to Laverne and then the next phase, which I would certainly support if I were back to do so, and the next round would be to take it to Worthington and take it to the Iowa border and then say, now it's up to you. Dave, was a billion, Governor, was a billion dollar uh, bonding bill, would you still, if you were reelected, recommend another bond? Next year, probably said, yes. You want one every year? Well, I mean, uh, you know, there have been bills in every year more often than not in the last 20 years since repurposed discovered the 
that's the story for the other another day. But um, but they, you know it's it's become commonplace and unfortunately in 2011 uh, it was obviously bipartisan support there it was Republican majorities the House and Senate and to, to their credit they recognized that with extremely low interest rates and with uh, unemployment as severe as it was throughout the state especially in the building trades that that was uh, you know really uh, those are really important projects and I appreciate the support they provided there again it wasn't as much as I would have wished for but it was something and then last spring various uh, Considerations derailed a, a full-scale funding bill, but we did provide the money to get the capital renovations started and a few other things. So, you know, I don't think it's without, it's, it's not without precedent to have an annual bill. And if I'm back, I mean, I, I would reserve final judgment until I looked at the, at the various economic conditions. And as I say, I look at how we could address this, well, I thought up until now this chronic shortage of resources, but I'm going to pursue Commissioner Scholder's invitation to look with the existing capacity. Uh, Any other questions on this topic? Get you guys, you give me the signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. That was good. Any else on this bill? Any else? Governor, um, you mentioned that the Southwest Life Forum project, uh, you, you referred to its status and privacy as good. Um, does the exclusion of this in your bill suggest that you are, or the support for the project is wavering? And how, how much in trouble do you think the project is? No, I proposed last year. I did, it was not in my bill last year. And the, the cost of it, $125 million, and it could be more than that, $150, $160 million, it really is, is I mean, the, the, the cost of these projects is, is again, out, eclipsed the capacity within our uh, previously used uh, general obligation bonds for these projects, which is why I proposed last session the half cent metro sales tax increase uh, that would go to, could completely fund the completion of the Southwest Light Rail Line and then other projects now on the boards for the rest of the metro area buses and beginning of, of some light rail projects and then would con have a continuing funding source to really advance those projects. You know, we for years have suffered from doing these piecemeal and we get some federal money, we combine it with some state money, and we do that piece, and then we try to do another piece, and we do another piece, and then we don't have enough money for the pieces that we need. So, for example, the um, North Star uh, train goes, stops 12 miles short of the largest population center in the entire region, St. Cloud, which if you want to drive down ridership, you couldn't think of a worse way to do so than, than that. Uh, it resulted in the Central Corridor being rammed down the throats of the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota and the administration who are constitutionally charged with the decision-making authority about what's in the best interest of the university and what's not. And once again, it's like, well, we, you know, we don't have enough money and the feds, you know, can only do this much and I don't know that anybody ever went back to the federal government and, and pressed that point. Uh, I was not in the Senate then, but when I was in the Senate, the Senators, I suppose the congressmen, women from Mich from Mississippi, got uh, two billion dollars inserted into a transportation bill to reroute a whole rail line across the entire width of the state of Mississippi. So I know what's possible. Now they, you know, against the earmarks and all those things, and so there are other constraints. But you know, the fact is, the resources are potentially available. You just got to go out and work really hard to get them, and you have to have the the, the capacity in within the state. So when there is an opportunity, if there is a piece of money, if somebody is a couple of years ago returned, was it Florida, I believe it was, returned money because they, they, they'd they been granted by the federal government and suddenly that was available, you have to have the internal capacity then to say, hey, we can, if you give us a, this amount of money, we have the state uh, funding and the local funding already in place to, to proceed. So longer than a way of saying it's not in there. I think we've got a better and necessary alternative way to fund it uh, into the future. Okay. You're welcome to stay around for this. Great, we can take questions. Well, let me just, I'm just going to say, uh, I'd like to restate what I, I wrote yesterday. I was, and to answer a couple questions that have come up, uh, Lieutenant Governor established yesterday as the day she wanted to make her press announcement, and on Wednesday last week I got not only invited to the 
National Government Association Executive Committee meeting with the President and the Vice President, but also called by uh, David Agnew, the Deputy uh, Chief of Staff, the White House for Intergovernmental Relations, and, and, and asked to go so they could have an even balance. There were three Republican governors, three Democratic governors. So that's where I went yesterday and concluded my participation. And, and Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor did a magnificent, just magnificent job of, of handling that uh, situation and responding to questions and, and the like. And I really have nothing else uh, that I could add to what she said, and I'd just like to restate for the record my uh, remarks yesterday that were published uh, that throughout her 25 years of devoted public service as Duluth City Council member and council president, state senator and lieutenant governor, Yvonne Pretner Solon has been a courageous champion for the people of Minnesota. Lieutenant Governor Pretner Solon's tireless leadership on behalf of Minnesota senior citizens and people with disabilities has greatly improved many lives. She's been key to achieving our administration's primary mission, building a better Minnesota for all of our citizens. I thank Yvonne for her invaluable service to our state, and I pledge my continuing support for the important initiative she has championed as Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor. I'd be glad to respond to questions. Let's cover this subject now, and then we'll see if there's anything else after. So, okay. Governor, who's on your shirt list of potential uh, running mates? Well, I'm not ready to discuss that at this point, but uh, I'm certainly, now that this decision has been made and announced, uh, involved uh, actively in that consideration. Did you try to dissuade the Lieutenant Governor from not running again? Did you want her to stay on the ticket? Well, you know, again, I don't really have anything to add to what she said yesterday, and I think she said that, you know, I, I, she didn't, I didn't ask her to leave, I didn't ask her to stay, I left it basically up to her, uh, and we had a discussion on Monday, and I had intimations beforehand that that was, she's leaning in the direction of uh, going back home, and that's the announcement she made. So why didn't you ask her to stay if she was as great as you just said? I'm, you know, again, I think she answered these questions superbly well yesterday, she's made enormous contributions to my administration, to the state of Minnesota throughout her years of public service. Been a tremendous leader and public servant, and I, I think that uh, that's where I'll leave it. You have until June to, to fill this void. Do you intend to, to end act much sooner? Or much sooner. Like, much, like how soon? Much, what's your, what's your personal much, time? much sooner. Shortly. How soon would you like one? Shortly. <laughs> <laughs> what's your process? <laughs> Shortly. Lieutenant Governor said yesterday she thought the role needed to be beefed up. Do you agree with that? And, and what would be some ideas for doing that? Well, there was excellent editorial in your paper this morning about the, and, and I agree with it, and I think she uh, touched on this also, that some of the, the structural deficiencies that really compound the, the problem is of just finding a, a role and, and establishing that and proceeding. So I, I think those are excellent recommendations. There are a couple, uh, and I will give the, those more thought in, before the session. Um, and one thing that's always come to my mind is, is uh, the, the Lieutenant Governor's on the Executive Council. That meets first uh, five uh, constitutional officers, and then Lieutenant Governor leaves, and the four remaining uh, constitute the State Board of Investment. Well, the Lieutenant Governor is just as well qualified financial expertise in the previous couple of decades as anyone else on the the uh, board and why, why the, and also means we have now four members, which means you need a three to one vote to proceed in any way, so why not have uh, the five? And, and that's a very significant, very important responsibility. So those would be the kind of things I'd look for in terms of statute and also then, you know, I'm sure whoever I'm talking to about the positions is gonna have, you know, questions about what those responsibilities will, would be, and, and I'll have questions about what that person wants those responsibilities to be, and, and we'll work with uh, what we have. But I think it's an important position. I think it could be made a more important position, and I'll do my best to see that that uh, happens. Governor, what are you looking for in a lieutenant governor? Well, the very best, somebody who's eminently well qualified to lead the state if, if there's something unforeseen happens to, to me. I think that should be any chief executive decision of any governor, obviously president. Um, and then somebody who can really, you know, go around the state, be active, is in a position to really travel the state, 
be the, uh, the people's representative back here in St. Paul, but be a point of contact where people have a sense that they can express directly to, uh, to their government what uh, the problems are. You know, I give my home phone number out because I get many of my best ideas from people who are just calling directly that don't have to filter through the bureaucratic layers. The president said yesterday to governors, uh, he didn't give out his home phone number, but you can call the main number and they'll route you. Um, but you know, again, if there are problems, bring them directly to, to him or to his top people. You know, and I think any of us, in, as he, well, he stressed, he said, I want, I want government to work. Well, I want government to work, and I want it to work better. And I want a person who understands the structure of government, state government, local government, and the relationships there, and, and you know, agrees with me that government is vitally important, and that government uh, can stand a considerable improvement, and we will do everything we can if I have four more years to achieve uh, those goals. How important would geography and gender be? Does geography matter that is balance or politics? Well, it's, it's certainly a consideration. It's, it's historically been a consideration. I consider myself a governor for all of Minnesota. I've traveled this state more miles uh, in the last uh, 35 years than anybody else in public life in Minnesota. I'm quite certain of that. And in recent years, 87 counties in 87 days and other initiatives. I mean, I, I you know, anybody can only be from one place. So I'm from Minneapolis, now it's temporarily St. Paul. and. Lieutenant Governor's from Duluth, but that means there's nobody from southwestern Minnesota or southeastern. I mean, you can only be from one area, but you're not elected governor or lieutenant governor from Minneapolis or from Duluth. You're elected governor of Minnesota and lieutenant governor of Minnesota. And your responsibility is statewide. And that's why, again, I say I want a lieutenant governor who's, in terms of um, his or her personal life situation and inclination is willing to, to be on the road, travel a lot, and be, and really in, spirit that outreach, bring uh, agency heads along with uh, her or him when that uh, is necessary, but really engage the people where they live. How about gender as well as geography? Is that a factor? It's become almost a tradition. It has. I mean, I, th I think it's an important statement, of a, of a, a very important statement. I mean, I've, my running mates have been uh, and proposed running mates have been women. I thought that was important at the time to show that, that respect and that balance. And uh, my uh, senior staff has here been, I started out with, I called the Magnificent Seven, and they were all women. And then a couple of men have gotten into the senior ranks and diluted the, the caliber. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Likely to choose a woman, is that fair to say? This uh, it's, I just said it's an important consideration. And for the record, Bob Hume is superb. Hey, Governor. <laughs> Governor, we're running up on your next. Yeah, we've we got time for a few more questions. Yeah. Governor, have you talked to anyone yet, or have you? I've talked informally to a couple of people, but now I'll enter a, a stage of more formal discussions. When you announced it on the and as your running mate, I recall you saying she would be different and more involved in your administration. She has said in the past, again yesterday, that she thought she would be more involved in policy initiatives. Did you lead her on, and would your next pick be different? Well, I didn't lead her on, certainly. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to reconstruct the last three years, and you know, whatever happened didn't happen. I, she expressed her disappointment; it didn't turn out the way she had hoped, and I. Disappointed it didn't turn out the way I hoped and the way we both hoped. And again, I think a lot of that was well captured in the editorial day as, as being you know, structural. And I also pointed out, and when we met on Monday, you know, the first six months here were the Republican majorities in the legislature, and they came in, and to their credit, they came in the first day of the session in the beginning of January, and they had a full agenda, and they were full force, and we were late in getting uh, finally, you know, the election resolved, and then therefore late in hiring agency heads and then wait and getting any of our own policy initiatives prepared and put into legislation. So we were, you know, this is a very much more chaotic operation internally and probably in terms of external uh, interactions than, than, than it certainly is now and really was after that point in time. And I think that left everybody out in, in limbo. Governor, 
elsewhere in the Capitol, a uh, Senate committee is talking about that controversial Senate office building. <clears throat> is that becoming an election year liability? And what do you view as the future of that building? Is it going to get built? Well, I've supported the need for a Senate office building and to relieve the pressures on the state office building, which I see some people now disavowing for uh, what I think are political campaign reasons. Uh, if we're going to do this right, and we're going to, in my view, get most legislators out of here and into suitable offices in either the state office building or a, another building, uh, this, that needs to go on at the same time as this project. But yes, I mean, it's certainly become partisan and political and campaign oriented. And I've had informal conversations with both uh, Majority Leader Bach and Speaker Thiessen and uh, without any, reaching any conclusions, but expressing my concerns about the, the overall cost. And we've had the Department of Administration now uh, do scenarios that will reduce, would reduce the cost 10, 20, $30 million a piece. That's not gonna satisfy people who are now opposed to it, including people who I understood from Senator Bach, he thought were agreeable to a bipartisan approach, but that's, that's evidently fallen apart, and so we'll have to deal with it now as the situation as, as it is. And that means very partisan, very political, and I haven't had a chance again to talk with the Speaker or the Majority Leader about the new reality, but certainly will in the very near future. Governor, you, you suggested earlier this week, and not to change the subject, I apologize before you go, but that you'd be open to signing a medical marijuana bill, um, possibly after a state-sponsored study of how it's been perceived and uh, handled in other states. I'm curious why the change of heart and why in the past did you give a, a priority to, towards law enforcement over the medical community and patients? Well, first question, you know, as, as I've been engaged in, with people on both sides of this question, and I, and I really, you know, respect the sincerity of, of people on both for and against uh, legalization of uh, marijuana for medical uses. I realize there's just, a, a, at least for me, so many unanswered questions that really have a bearing on how many people are we talking about? How many people, you know, can only get the medical benefits that they need from using marijuana versus all the other pharmacological options that are legal and can be prescribed. Um, what's the cost of setting up these different uh, distribution centers, one in every county, and, and then a uh, network for, you know, the growing and, and the control and the sale? How, how can they, you know, very valid concerns of law enforcement that, and the experiences of other states that have seen a, a wide proliferation of of use of marijuana in the general public, even uh, with uh, the limitation on medical California. I mean, I have friends who live in California and just find anybody in the neighborhood who, you know, get a blank medical thing and sign it and get yourself a sash. So, I mean, there, so the cost, the cost and benefit part of it, as well as what are the experiences of other states? We're, you know, 21 states now that have adopted this. Uh, where has it gone wrong? Where has it, where has it gone right? What are the key factors in, in it being going right or not? Is it possible to address through those experiences the primary concerns of law enforcement that we already have a you know drug epidemic in this state in so many ways and they got to deal with it both in terms of the the uh, trafficking of it, the sale of it, and the and the people who come into the state to sell this stuff. I mean you know we got gangs in small Minnesota communities from, I'm told, from Mexico, from Los Angeles, who are armed to the hilt with uh, weaponry that goes way beyond anything that local law enforcement has in the state. And, and so when they say they don't want to invite more of that kind of element into the state and have to deal with more problems that are related, as well as the criminal acts and just the senseless acts that people commit on the influence of, of various uh, legal and, but certainly illegal drugs. I mean, to me that, the only way you, you could have a chance of, of resolving or reconciling those very, very different and strongly held views is by getting as some objective information. And is that gonna resolve the controversy? No, probably not. Is it open or possibly to finding some way, of, of some, some area of common ground? I, I would hope so, we'll have to see. But I, I just don't think uh, it's gonna be it's going to proceed otherwise, and I told law enforcement when I screened with them in 2010 that I wouldn't support anything that they 
strongly opposed, and I've kept that promise, and I'll keep that promise. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>